um, before we get started, Kevin said I was allowed to do this. Uh, like I was just on vacation, so if you don't like it, give me, give me a break, okay? <laughs> he says, didn't you preach, and now you're preaching, you went on vacation, you work on vacation? I prepared a little bit before on the plane here, which was delayed by a lot. Uh, we, I worked on it some more, so hopefully we're going to do this today, but I'm setting it up, uh, this whole collection that we're going to be doing called Overflowing. Uh, and I'm super excited about this because most of the time when it comes to faith, it's this ambiguous thing, right? It's this algorithm or something out there that I got to figure out the, the faith part, you know, so that I can be what God has called me to be or make him happy or whatever. And so we're always trying to figure out what's, is it, do I wear the right things? Do I do the right things? How, how do I show and develop faith? Because it's not always a tangible thing. Well, I say that, but it actually is. And we'll get to that in just a second. So you've heard stories of people that they appear to have crazy faith. You ever met crazy Christians that even though just like the sky is falling around them, they got a smile on their face. So you don't know if they're if they got a mental illness or, or if they're just, they just have that much faith that God is in control, that no matter what happened or what came along, they had the same confidence that God was in control. Nothing shook them regardless of what life throws. They are confident. Hannah and I have the unique access into people's lives uh, where we get to see faith happen. I brought a bug back from Mexico with me. <laughs> Um, we have a. We were able to see into people's lives, and when they something bad happens, right? You, you know, whatever that lose somebody or, or a job or whatever it is, and Hannah and I go to comfort them, right? And we're like, well, let's you know, we're we're in this together. We can you can get through this. And sometimes it happens more often than I think that it would happen. But sometimes there are people that we go to comfort and we leave comforted. <laughs> and inspire, we go to inspire them, and we're the ones that leave inspired because they are just so full of, of energy about it. And so, even regardless of the circumstances, they're, they're still hopeful, and they and they have good vibes, you know, rolling out of that place. And it's it's strange. And I'm like, how is this possible? These are the people that have overflowing faith. We expect to hear extraordinary grief and sadness. But sometimes the opposite is true. People like this are convinced there is more to life than this life. There's more to us, more to the inside, our souls, than there is just to this life. There's something more. They experience suffering, pain, and disappointment within the context of a God who knows and cares and may intervene on their behalf. They don't have bla uh, amazing beliefs. They have amazing faith and overflowing faith. And what that faith kind of looks like, it's an active, gritty confidence in God that it causes them to activate, to do things, to move in confidence that God is going to be who God is and God is going to come through in the way that God comes through. It influences their responses and decisions in their life. Where... Does that kind of faith come from? Because what I just stated, what, I mean, I think everybody in the room would be like, yeah, I'd love to hear that. I'd love to have that in my life. I'd love to have that kind of faith, that crazy person faith. I hope someday does somebody look at me and go, what a crazy Christian, right? I, you hope for that because that's, that's, the, that's the main goal. So how do we get it? Where does that come from? That's what this collection is going to be all about. So if you are somebody that is sitting here or listening to this message and is saying, I have lost my faith, or you are somebody that is beginning to lose your faith, or you're somebody who has completely lost it, and now you're trying to regain it, you're trying to find your way back, this collection is for you. This is for you. And it may explain what happened to you. So let's jump in. All right, so... When we follow Jesus through the Gospels, only two things are, are there are only two things that amazed or caused Jesus to marvel. There was only two things that Jesus went, oh, 
that caught me off guard a little bit, right? <laughs> We're talking about the God of the universe who knows everything, can read people's minds and throw you know, words out there that just stumble everybody, all that kind of stuff. He was marveled at two things. Matthew records the first one, um, and it's in a good way. Um, the cent- a centurion approaches Jesus and asks him to heal a servant that he has. And Jesus offers, he says, okay, I'll come with you. He offers to follow the centurion back to where the servant is. And the centurion basically says this, says, you don't need to do that. I know how it works. This is what he says exactly in Matthew 8, 9 through 10. Uh, It says, for myself, I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. He's saying, you don't need to do that. He's like, I get it. This is basically what he's saying. He says, They don't obey me because of me. They obey me because of who I represent. I represent the Roman Empire. Jesus, I've been watching you. Clearly, you represent something or someone bigger. To heal my servant, then just do what I do. Issue a command. He's been watching Jesus, and he's noticed. There's something unique about this guy. Just like how I can say a word and something happens in in a place where I don't, I'm not there physically, he knows that Jesus can do the same in a different realm that he doesn't have any control over. And so he's asking Jesus for help, which was a great thing to do. Then he takes it up a notch. He's like, but no, you don't have to go where he is. I, I know how this works. I've seen how you operate. And so from that, this is what Jesus said, verse 10, it says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. He was astonished. He was impressed. But by what? People ask Jesus for favors all the time. He had just healed a leopard, and that was like a Tuesday. He's like, ah, you know, there you go. You're healed. You know, he can move along. Like, he wasn't amazed by it. That was just normal behavior for Jesus. Fortunately, Jesus tells us what he was amazed by. And continue on in verse 10, it says, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Jesus was amazed by big, bold, actively informed faith. But what made it amazing was the centurion put two and two together. He recognized the uniqueness of Jesus. And when he did, he went all in. He was saying to Jesus, if you choose to do this, you don't need to come home with me. Just do it. Just issue the command. Just make it happen. Here's here's a fun fact about Jesus, and I I hate to disappoint some of you if you're in this realm, but Jesus was never marveled at any, he's never marveled at anyone's knowledge or obedience. You're like, I'm going to make God love me more, I'm going to memorize more scripture, and I'm going to memorize more. Unfortunately, knowledge was never really impressed God, because he has all the knowledge. (laughs) And then, On the opposite side, the obedience side, they were really good at obedience to a fault in this time. They were so good at obedience that they compacted it. They compounded on it. They put laws on top of laws on top of laws on top of laws so they would completely obey God, and God would be happy with them. He was never impressed by obedience. Jesus was never impressed by that because that's easy. If you're just following something, following a direction, that easy. That, that's why cops are amazed when they pull you over and you're going 120 and they're like, why couldn't you just go 60 like the rest of us, right? And then they got to issue a ticket. It wasn't that hard. It's actually harder to push the pedal further down. I mean, sometimes. I don't, for some of you, it might be easier to push the pedal further down than it is to hold up. But it just depends on you and how you learned how to drive. But he was never marveled. He's never marveled at obedience. Jesus was most amazed by someone with extraordinary faith that was lived out in the reality of life. That's what he was amazed by. So that's the first incident. The second incident occurred uh, while he was visiting his hometown. Uh, he was teaching and healing, as Jesus did. He taught, he healed. You know, that was kind of his thing. That's what he did. Initially, folks were astonished and amazed by him. But remember, this was his hometown. He wasn't a stranger there. They knew, known him from since he was a niño, right? He was a little guy, a little, little dude. Sorry, I just came from Mexico. Yeah, it's just still, still in there. Fluent. Uh, so <laughs> they knew him. 
they're like, uh, you know, so they were, they were amazed by it. The te- I mean, and then initially, folks were amazed, but the, uh, jealousy began to creep in with the people of that town. And they said in Mark 6, 3, it says, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They're going, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy isn't that special. But we know him. We know his family. Jesus, God, God would not just come from humans. That's not how they perceived God was going to come. Granted, in their defense, most of the time before that, it was like ascending from heaven and like on top of a mountain, you know, all these kind of things that God would reveal himself. So granted, there was some history there that they were expecting some fireworks, you know, when the Son of Man came, when the the Messiah arrived. And so they're kind of like, he's just ordinary like us, right? But now he thinks he's better than us? What was Jesus' response to that? (laughs) Verse 6, it says, he was amazed by their lack of faith. He was amazed by their lack of faith of faith. So there it is, the two things that have amazed Jesus in Scripture that we can find. It was great faith and a lack of faith. (laughs) Isn't that wild to think? That means everybody in the middle were not amazing Jesus. (laughs) Either (laughs) if you wanted to get Jesus' attention, you had to pick one, all right? You had to be an extreme on either side, right? kind of like politics nowadays. We're not really shocked by anything until it's the extreme sides. It's kind of like, wow, I didn't think anybody would do, actually do that or go that far or, or make that happen, right? And all Everything in the middle is just normal, right? Everything is just what is expected. Jesus' agenda for his first century followers and his 20th century, 20th century followers, you guys, um, was that people would be characterized by active in spite of faith. But this is where folks got it confused. Uh, They were confusing the message of Jesus. They said that faith, they kind of confused it with optimism. And it was, optimism is always an object, right? When it comes to faith, there's always an object. Optimism is just hope and and all. It's just kind of like there's nothing really there. There's not a substance for that, right? So faith has to have an object. So just like yesterday, and it was touch and go a little bit, uh, we boarded a plane. Anytime you board a plane, or this might be the reason why you don't get on a plane, I, I, don't, I don't know. But when you board a plane, you could ask any of the passengers, and you would say, hey, are you hopeful that you're going to make it to your destination? And they would go, yeah, of course. And you would say, oh, then they have hope. Not really. They don't have hope, just blind hope. They have a little bit of assurance. They have faith in the mechanical engineering of the metal bird that they're about to get into. They have faith in watch, when they watch all the people scurrying around and and putting gas in it and, and cleaning it up and fixing things and getting it ready for the next flight. They have faith that the the uh, pilots have been trained well, and their decisions that they're going to make is going to get them safely to where... So there always is, is an object. It's very rare, very rare, that somebody has hope or is optimistic about a situation without some kind of historical evidence that it's going to work out. That's very uncommon. So faith, hope, all that has to have an object. So when you're placing your optimism, your hope into something, your faith into something, there's usually something linked to it. Those are the objects of your faith. The object of your faith is not a particular outcome. Faith isn't thinking that everything will be fine, like the flowers will just arrange themselves. Sometimes they do. Not all the time does that happen. So it's not always just going to work out That's hope and optimism. Jesus wasn't amazed at the centurion's hope and optimism. He was amazed at the man's faith in him. The point of his earthly ministry is that Jesus established 
himself as the object of faith. He invited his followers to believe in and trust in him. So one night, Jesus was arrested. Um, Jesus had a long, disturbing, and confusing conversation with his apostles just before that. But toward their end of the time together, he tells them in John 14, 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me also. Those were big words. Believe, I'm sorry, believe also in me. Jesus is saying to trust me like you trust God. Trust me like you trust God. Jesus established himself as the object of their faith and ours. But something else was going on here. Jesus positioned himself as the object of faith because Jesus came to show us what God is like. He came to show us what truly is it like to be in the presence kind of the presence of God. What is his personality like? What is his characteristics? How would he operate amongst humans if he was talking to us one-on-one or groups or whatever, as we're all here on earth, subject to the laws of this earth. He came to show what God is like. He came to reveal the true nature of the Father. In many assumptions about what God is like, most were wrong, still a lot are wrong, but one of the reasons Jesus came was to correct the incorrect assumptions. i I always said that when we planted Village Heights, we couldn't just start. People did not care that we were here. I'm glad that you guys care and yet you're here right now, okay? But there was a time years, 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 years ago, nobody cared. And they did not want us here. Not that they were going to chase us out, but they were like, ah, we're okay. You know know what I mean? (laughs) So it was like that for a while. And I kept saying, not only... Do we need to start and operate and preach and do the things that you do in a church and, and, and all this stuff? But now we have to rewrite what people think about church because whatever they've experienced before, whatever they've been exposed to before, whether it's news or in reality or whatever it may be in their family, whatever it may be, has been so bad that they now blame God and they do not come to church. They're like, if that's God, I don't want anything to do with that. So now we had to rewrite what people think about church. That's, that can be difficult. But Jesus was so clear about these incorrect assumptions, and I've, I kind of took the lead on that too. I'm, I'm so clear about what Village Heights is that sometimes it's offensive to people, and I'm sorry. And some people are like, oh, this isn't the church for me. And I was like, oh, sorry, there's another one down the road. And you throw a rock, you'll, bing, 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 bing. you'll hit five of them probably. Um, So why don't you head out to one of those, you know, kind of thing. And people are baffled by that. But this is where Jesus was. He was so clear that it was offensive. He was saying, if you want to know what God is like, watch me. Listen to me and follow me. This was extremely offensive, but it's the reason why he came. So if you read the Gospels with this question in mind, what do I learn about God from Jesus? It changes the game. Jesus came so that we could know what our heavenly father was like. In John 9, the apostles were walking with Jesus and they see a blind man. They thought God punished people. This is really how they think. Some people think this way today, which baffles me, but they still do. That they thought if you had a sickness or an affliction or a disability or whatever it may be, um, they thought God was mad at you. Because of something you did or because of what your parents did or your family did, you are now being punished with an affliction. So now, not only was it bad enough that people were sick, now they viewed them as you're bad. You're not only sick, but now you're bad, which kind of gave them the justification to expel them away, send them away, get out of here. You are, you're you're infecting us. You're, you're hurting us because of what you've done or what your family has done. So they thought God punished people with illnesses. So they asked Jesus. They said, who sinned? When they, saw the, when they saw the blind man, they said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus basically tell them, tells them, guys, that's not how it works. <laughs> this is not how it works. What you have based a lot of your belief system on is not true at all. That's not what God is like. 
Another day, when Jesus was teaching, he was asked, Do you, you said, love my neighbor? Which Judeans do I have to consider my neighbors? They were already Jewish, right? And they lived in Judea. And now they're saying, okay, in our already community that we have, which ones can I not love? It's like, what? Wait, that should be the easiest ones for you to love because you already speak the same language and love the same things, right? That should be easy. So they were trying to dice up amongst their already community that they should be loving. It's like, which ones do I have to love? Have you met that lady, though? Ah, that dude that runs that carriage shop or whatever they, the cart shop, I, he, 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 he bamboozled me. He stole from me. He didn't need a new axle, right? You, you have these things, and they're trying to decide, which ones do I have to love? And Jesus responds with a story about a good Samaritan. His point of that story was that God doesn't have favorites, Jesus redefined the word neighbor for them. Neighbor isn't just the people that you like. Those are your friends. Your neighbor is anybody, anybody around you. So a neighbor is anyone who has need that you can meet. Matthew 5, 43, starting there, it says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay, leading up to Jesus that was a fair assumption to make, right? That was, up to this point, that's how God's people were led, right? And if it was good enough for King David, it's got to be good enough for us. Besides, what's the alternative? And here's what God is like. He says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. They're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Now I got to pray and love my enemies? I don't like this deal, Right? I liked it when it was more clear-cut. You know, the people I just didn't like, I didn't have to talk to, right? I got to hate them. He's saying, no, 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 pray for them. You ever prayed for an enemy before? It is probably one of the difficult things that you will ever do. Most difficult, for sure. I have just about vomited at times trying to pray for my enemies because they were too much up here. If you want to be like your Father in heaven, he's saying, love your enemies because your Father in heaven loves your enemies. This is such a paradigm shift for them in this time. It's still a paradigm shift for humanity. Jesus came to explain what God is like, see and accept him as the object of their faith. That was his hopes. They were thinking, wait, so God likes everybody? And Jesus just replied with the proof. He said, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. The only thing that I could think of that could measure up to this logic is if you are a parent or an uncle and one of your nieces and nephews uh, are fighting and they want to know who's the favorite. <laughs> and you're like, ah, you, you both are. <laughs> I do different things with each of you, right? I appreciate different things about you, but I love you both. I can't decide. Jesus feels the same way. God feels the same way about us. He's not going to decide amongst his children, even though some might be a little more naughty than others. God extends his grace to everyone, and that was so different for them in this time. Jesus came to reveal the nature of his Father, also to help people trust in him. Jesus presented himself as an invitation to trust in God as he actually is. If you want to know what God is like, don't begin in Genesis. And I know that sounds crazy. <laughs> I know that sounds wild. Don't begin in Genesis. Start in the New Testament. Start in the Gospels. Okay? Once you read the Gospels, once you figure out the identity of Jesus and who he is, his characters, his aspects, all that, then you go back and read the Old Testament. A lot of it begins to make sense. You're like, wow, okay, that, that makes perfect sense of why God would make that move or do that, or his hands were tied because his son hasn't come to earth yet. It, makes, it, it really just opens it up. Paul understood this. He understood this. He understood that uh, better than anyone in his time is that he was, he was at the epicenter of a transition. He understood, the, because of that, he understood the relationship between 
uh, Jewish religion, pagan religions, and this Jesus thing, this new Jesus thing. He summarizes it in a letter to the Colossians, uh, referring to all the traditions of all the world religions. He pre- pretty much just summed them all. He's like, I want to pick a fight with all of them. Here we go. Right here. I'm going to insult all of them at all at once, including Judaism, <laughs> what he came from. And so he writes in Colossians 2.17, he says, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. Um, you can learn a lot about something from a shadow, but you can't learn everything about something from a shadow. That's why sometimes shadows confuse us and scare us. Because depending on where the light is coming from and how far away I am from that light, shadows can grow or they can shrink. So you can kind of get the basic shape. You can kind of guess, oh, it has four legs, maybe. Maybe it's 20. I don't know. There's multiple light sources coming. You say, it's hard to tell, but you know something is there because of its shadow. So you can learn a lot, but you can't learn everything. And so when the shadow caster appears, the shadow is far less consequence to your life. And not because it was incorrect, but because it was incomplete. So Paul continues. He says, I'll, I'll restart it from the beginning. He says, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. He's saying what we've seen from God is just shadows. But if you want to see the source of the shadows, that's Jesus. Just look at him. Just watch him. And you will see the ripple effect. Jesus' apostles had grown up in the shadow of the, in the reflection of Jesus. Paul was saying he was the same way. It did, it, 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 he, he, wait. He, he did his best to understand. I'm doing my best to read. He did his best to understand what God is like. It was why Jesus had so much explaining to do. He had to rewrite what people thought about God because they had made a lot of assumptions based on the shadows that he was casting. <laughs> And so if you were raised in that shadow, the first century audience had, to do, had some unlearning to do. Some of us are raised in a religious shadow, a hierarchy that tells us this is the way it's done. This is the way it's always been done because we built this organization. We have the copyright for the name and the logo and da-da-da-da-da and all, this, all these things. So you should listen to us, right? You might have to be rewrite what you think about church what Jesus created because there is a shadow that's affecting your view of it. Jesus was the perfect representation of the Father. It was as if Jesus said, if you want to know what God is like, don't look past me or stop short of me. Everything before me was a sign pointing to me so that I could point you to the Father. So not so you could know more about him, so you could have a relationship with him, that you shouldn't be surprised that when Jesus emphasizes on active faith and trust, after all, isn't that the currency of relationships? Trust? Anytime a couple comes to me and they're going through a situation and they need some advice and, and they, they to fix it, what's the, who's, who's wrong and all this, it really doesn't matter because whatever is done has been done. And what has been lost because of the actions of what has been done is trust. You cannot have a strong marriage without trust. You cannot have a strong friendship without trust. You can't have a strong relationship with Jesus, Father God, without trust. You got to be able to trust him. And they knew that they were having a hard time trusting which shadow was right. And was that the right thing that God said? And so Jesus came to set the record straight. This is what you should trust in. It's not about obedience or fear. If your relationships are based on obedience and fear, I'm sorry, but you are leading to destruction. The currency of relationship is trust. And so throughout his ministry, Jesus invites people to a place where they can place their trust in himself as it reflects who God is. So in Genesis, what was broken in the Garden of Eden? It wasn't an apple. (laughs) It's not apples are evil, you know. (laughs) It was trust. They broke God's trust in them. 
He told them one thing. Just don't touch this one thing. Just leave this one thing. And he, they broke the trust. It's no surprise that throughout the Gospels, Jesus invites us to trust and believe in him. Jesus tells his first century, first century followers, I want to be the object of your faith and trust. When I go away, you will know who God is and what he is like. So you can have a relationship with him because you'll know you can trust him. Because I am the representative here. This is what the centurion noticed, that you are a part of something bigger. And if I hang around you enough and I ask you enough, right, I, I know it's going to tie me to something bigger. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. So putting this all together, God so loved the world. God so desired a relationship with people in the world that God revealed himself through Jesus. It's difficult to have a relationship with a shadow. You never know where to stand with the shadow. Every terrible relationship that people come to talk to me about, it's because the person they're with is giving them shadows. It's like a shadow game. They don't know who they really are. I don't know if I can really trust them. They say this, and then they do this. They act this way in front of some people, and then they act this way at home. I don't know what to do because the shadows, they're following them, and they don't know who the real thing is. God came, Jesus came to fix that. So he invited people to trust him, putting it all together. You never know where you stand with the shadow. So since trust or faith is the currency of relationship, authentic relationship, Jesus invites us to do so. So they are trusting in and establishing a relationship with the one who sent him. And then it's God the Father. Here, here's what uh, we discover in the Gospels that when you discover in your life or by talking to people who have unshakable faith in God, God is most honored. He is most honored when you are living and active, death-defying, in spite of trust in Him. That's what God desires. This is what having a relationship with God is about. This is how Christian maturity is measured. So God wants us to mature to the point where we confront every challenge with a question. I'll give you some examples. What would I do if I wasn't confident if, of God was with me? You know people like that. Like, what, how would I operate my decisions every day and then the big ones? How would I operate if I knew and I was confident that God was with me. How would it change how I talk to people? How would it change how I operate my business? How would it change how I lead my family? How would it change how I love my spouse if I know that God is always with me? These kind of people, they are inspiring. They forgive. They love. They show up. They step up. Their faith is seen in a way uh, that they respond to life. When we see that kind of faith, we want that kind of faith. We wonder how they got the confidence and peace. We wonder how they got, got it and maintain it. How we can get it and how can we collect all of that? How do we aspire and dream and, and grow into that? That's what this collection is going to be. Over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at how do we develop that kind of faith, that overflowing faith. It's what it's all about, but it's not until we understand that, that Jesus, the perfect, he's the perfect reflection of who God is, that we are able to take steps of creating an overflowing act of faith. So the next few weeks, we're going to talk about God He's used, how, we're, how he uses these five things to grow, deepen, and mature our faith. We have, we're going to gather them together. We're going to present them to you, and I, and I hope they help. And anyone, anyone um, that hears it, I, I hope it, it, it catches them. Because when Hannah and I started Village Heights, we wanted to create spaces for others to develop overflowing faith. 
not to become the number one church on Instagram, not to, to get the biggest building ever, you know, not to do all of these things, not to erect a, a 50-foot cross you know, that everybody knows where our building is. You know, none of that stuff. And I'm not shaming any of that. That's not, but that's not what we're here to do. Hannah and I are here to challenge and to help and create space for you to grow overflowing faith to get you to a place where you feel safe enough and you trust God enough to really put yourself out there, to really put your life in his hands. And you're like, that's a big risk, Bill. I know because he's done it for me. I have confidence that he's going to do it for you. I want people to make their faith their own, not their parents' faith, not their uh, prescribed uh, religion's faith, none of that. Their faith in God. So we wondered what cultivates the development of overflowing faith. What are the factors needed to help people enrich their faith? There's five things that came to surface when people talk about their faith stories. They came straight from the teaching and life of Jesus. These five things are catalyzing. They intersect our lives in every season and are important because an active faith looks different in every season of life. You cannot expect your faith to perform the same way when you're on the hot mountain high and then when you're in the valley. The faith is different. It's not that it's not. The object of your faith is the same, but it changes based on your situation. It's like, what are the challenges of marriage? How does it affect our faith? What about faith while you're having kids or struggling to have kids? How do you... Hold on to faith if you're losing a child or a marriage. What if, what if you are experience a health challenge? How does that change your faith? Because faith in good times is easy. But how do you keep faith in the hard times? These faith catalysts are important in every season but look different. So in this collection, we will dive deep into each. And as we wrap up, uh, here are two reasons why it's so important. For you guys, if you have lost faith or you feel you're beginning to lose faith, this might explain why. It will give you a tangible as you try to work out the intangible. So in your life, you're like, I, I just, it's, I don't know where it is. It's ambiguous. I'm going to give you something tangible. I'm going to give you Jesus in different forms and fashions in different scenarios of faith so that you can hold on to that as be, you begin to try to grasp the untangible, which is God, the one we cannot fathom. He's too big for us. In my experience, people lose their faith for reasons that have little to do with Jesus. And so for the next five weeks, we will explore the five things God uses to give us overflowing faith, and we'll drive right into it the first faith catalyst next week. So here's three questions, and I promise I'm leaving you with this, and y'all can go eat lunch. Three <laughs> questions I want you to ponder this week. Three questions. So write them down, record them, whatever you got to do. Number one, before today's message, based on your experience as or with Christians, what would you have guessed Jesus was amazed by most? Before this message, if somebody walked up and asked you, what amazes Jesus the most, what would your response have been? Number two, who is the most amazing Christian you know personally and why? Who is that person in your life that you think is the greatest example? I hope it's not me because there's better ones out there. <laughs> who is the greatest example of a Christian in your life and why? And number three, what has contributed most to your personal faith in God? What has made it difficult to maintain faith? So what is the number one thing that has drawn you to God that maintains your faith, whatever faith that you have, whatever intangible thing, this, this thing that you can't see? How, what has maintained that? And then on top of that, what has made it difficult to maintain it? Everybody's faith takes a hit from time to time. Talking about it helps. So not only ask yourself these questions, but talk to somebody about it. Talk to somebody about it, because it's nice to learn that you're not crazy. 
that you're not the only one. You mean that church of all those Christians have doubts? Yes, they are human, just like you. It's good to hear that we're not all perfect. It helps to know that there are men and women who knew Jesus, and it's what we gather from Scripture, that they knew Jesus but personally lost their faith for, for a time. Every apostle did. Every follower of Christ did. So whether you're looking for faith or you're looking to regain faith, to strengthen your faith, or just to understand faith, don't miss a week. See you next week. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, as we struggle, as we attempt to understand this ambiguous thing called faith, as we try to grasp it and, and make it practical and instill it into our lives for real application in the seasons that we need it, Lord, help us to see through your eyes. Help us to understand who, we, who you are through Jesus as we watch Jesus and how he responds and how he acts, and that is just like you. That helps us build our faith in such a way, the parameters of our faith in such a way that we are strong even when it's hard, that when the times get tough, our faith is so overflowing that we have prepared for these moments that we look like crazy Christians that people go, how are you still happy in the midst of destruction? Help us to learn what that is and guide us through this process as we learn more about you and strengthen our faith to a point of overflowing. In Jesus' powerful name I pray, amen.